From New York, this is Democracy Now! We have uh, made a truly remarkable progress in moving our nation forward. We've all seen the encouraging news as we open up America again. More than three million jobs created in the last job report. Retail sales are rolling. Truly remarkable progress. Those were the words of Vice President Mike Pence describing the country's handling of the coronavirus pandemic as cases soar to record heights. The U.S. death toll has now topped 126,000, and one quarter of the million global COVID-19 cases are in the United States. We'll get the latest. Then we go to Colorado. A warning to our audience, this clip contains disturbing audio. I'm an introvert and I'm different. That's what Elijah McLean, a 23-year-old African-American massage therapist, cried out as police in Aurora, Colorado, attacked him when he was walking home from a store buying iced tea. He died in the hospital a few days later. That was almost a year ago. Protests are continuing in Colorado, calling for justice. We'll speak with the McLean family attorney. Then we go to Louisiana, where two environmental activists have been charged with terrorizing an oil and gas lobbyist for leaving plastic pollution at his home. We have uh, millions of nurdles, plastic pellets of Formosa's pollution uh, from Texas that we have brought here to Louisiana to make the point that this company should not get a water permit, should not get an air permit, should not be allowed to operate in the state of Louisiana. The arrested activists are part of a campaign to block Formosa Plastics from building a new plant in St. James Parish, Louisiana, in an area known as Cancer Alley. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Coronavirus cases have now topped 10 million worldwide, with over a half a million deaths. Cases continue to surge across much of the United States, where confirmed cases have now topped 2.6 million, with over 126,000 reported deaths. That's one quarter of the world's cases and deaths, though the U.S. has just over 4 percent of the global population. Spikes are being reported in 36 states. Only two states, Connecticut and Rhode Island, saw a decline in new cases compared to last week. On Friday, the U.S. reported the highest number of new cases in a single day since the start of the pandemic. At least a dozen states have paused their reopening. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom ordered bars in seven counties, including Los Angeles, to close. The governors of Florida and Texas have ordered bars to close, among other restrictions, in an attempt to curb the surge in cases. But they are still refusing to impose statewide stay-at-home orders or mandate the wearing of face masks. Secretary of Health and Human Services Alex Azar warned the U.S. needs to act immediately. The window is closing. We have to act, and people as individuals have to act responsibly. We need to social distance. We need to wear fi our face coverings if we're in settings where we can't social distance, particularly in these hot zones. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence Friday touted the nation's, quote, truly remarkable progress, unquote, even as the U.S. reported a record 40,000 new cases in the previous 24 hours. Pence recently canceled campaign events in Florida and Arizona due to the surge in cases. He did not, however, cancel an appearance at a Dallas church Sunday, where he wore a mask as he sat in the front row as a choir of over 100 people performed unmasked. Over 2,000 people attended the event, many also not wearing masks. This comes as reports emerge Friday that the Trump campaign ordered the removal of thousands of social distancing stickers on seats at his Tulsa rally last weekend. A reporter who covered the Tulsa rally recently said he tested positive for COVID-19. Many of Trump's campaign staffers have also gone into quarantine. 
A federal judge has ordered Immigration and Customs Enforcement to release immigrant children from its family detention centers due to concerns over rising coronavirus infections. The order affects two immigrant prisons in Texas and one in Pennsylvania, as well as jails housing unaccompanied minors. Last week, court documents revealed 11 immigrants held inside a prison for families in Carnes, Texas, tested positive for COVID-19. U.S. District Judge Dolly Gee wrote, quote, the facilities are on fire and there is no more time for half measures. At least 750 ICE prisoners and 45 ICE workers have tested positive for the coronavirus. Coronavirus cases are continuing to increase across the global south. In India, the number of COVID-19 cases has topped half a million, and the peak of the pandemic is projected to be weeks away. Health officials warn the total number of cases could top a million by the end of the month. Iran's ordered residents to wear masks at indoor gathering places. On Saturday, Iran reported 127 deaths, its highest daily toll in three months. Meanwhile, Australia is reporting its biggest jump in COVID-19 cases in two months. Protest against racism and police violence continued over the weekend. In Louisville, Kentucky, a gunman fired more than a dozen rounds into a crowd of protesters late Saturday, killing one person, injuring another, and sending scores diving for cover. 27-year-old photographer Tyler Girth, a vocal supporter of the protest, died at the scene. Police arrested 23-year-old Stephen Nelson Lopez and charged him with murder and wanton endangerment. After the shooting of Authorities ordered an end to a protest encampment, which is demanding justice for Breonna Taylor, the 26-year-old African-American emergency medic who was shot to death by Louisville police inside her apartment in March. No officers have been charged in her killing. In Aurora, Colorado, police used pepper spray on crowds Saturday as thousands took to the streets, shutting down an interstate as they called for justice for Elijah McLean, who was killed by police last year. The 23-year-old African-American was tackled by police as he headed home from a local convenience store where he bought iced tea. The police placed him in a chokehold, then injected him with ketamine, paramedics did, who came to the scene. Also at Saturday's protest for McLean, a group of violinists held a vigil, playing their violins, an instrument Elijah McLean also played in his honor. Colorado Governor Jared Polis announced Thursday a special prosecutor would reopen a probe into the police killing of a Malaysia McLean. We'll have more on this story, speaking with the McLean family attorney, later in the broadcast. Here in New York, a protest occupation outside City Hall continues for a sixth straight day, with activists demanding at least a billion dollars in cuts to the police department's $6 billion budget. The encampment is set to continue until the city budget is submitted by a midnight deadline Tuesday. In Philadelphia, medical workers briefly took over the shuttered Hahnemann Hospital Saturday under the banner Care Not Cops, administering free health care before the occupation was scuttled by police and riot gear. Hahnemann Hospital was closed last September after a private equity executive launched a plan to turn the property into luxury condominiums. In Seattle, Washington, hundreds of protesters marched on the home of Mayor Jenny Durkin Sunday, rejecting her proposal to cut 5 percent from Seattle's police department. The protesters are demanding Seattle slash the police budget in half, reinvesting the funds in community programs. In Minnesota, the Minneapolis City Council continues its move to disband its police force Friday, as it unanimously voted for a charter amendment that would replace the police with the Department of Community Safety and Violence. Violence prevention. The popular uprising is forcing cities and major institutions around the country to reckon with its symbols of racism and colonialism. The Mississippi House and Senate voted Sunday to remove the Confederate battle emblem from its state flag following mounting pressure. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, that's the NCAA, said earlier this month it would not hold championship games in the state because of the flag, and Mississippi's state star running back, Kylan Hill, said he would no longer 
represent Mississippi unless the racist symbol was removed. In New Jersey, Princeton University said it will remove Woodrow Wilson's name from its public policy school and one of its residential colleges. Quote, Wilson's racism was significant and consequential, even by the standards of his own time, said Princeton's president. As president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson oversaw the segregation of federal agencies. New Jersey's Monmouth University also said it would remove Wilson's name from one of its buildings. In New York, city council members are calling for the removal of the statue of slave owner President Thomas Jefferson from the council chambers. And Newark, New Jersey, has taken down a statue of Christopher Columbus. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka also recently signed a bill to create the Office of Violence Prevention, which will be funded with 5 percent of Newark's police budget. Meanwhile, four men have been charged for trying to topple President Andrew Jackson's statue in Lafayette Square, near the White House. In Boston, Kevin Peterson, founder of the New Democracy Coalition, ended a one-week protest fast Sunday. He's been standing outside the famed Faneuil Hall, calling on city officials to rename the building and address systemic racism in Boston. We call Mayor Walsh again to the table to address the issue of white supremacy in the city by addressing the issue of uh, renaming Faneuil Hall. Uh, we cannot feel comfortable or at ease as citizens in this, this nation and in this city when the name of a slave owner sits us up atop a, a public building. President Trump retweeted a video Sunday of a man in the village's retirement community in Florida shouting white power at anti-racist protesters. President Trump shared the video Sunday morning with the caption, Thank you to the great people of the villages. The radical left do nothing, Democrats, and fall in the fall, unquote. The man who shouted white power was driving a golf cart with a Trump 2020 on its windshield. The video was removed from Trump's Twitter feed about three hours later. A White House spokesperson said Trump, quote, did not hear the one statement made on the video. What he did see was tremendous enthusiasm from his many supporters, the White House said. And yet, the White House press secretary, the deputy press secretary, did not condemn the term white power. Facebook said Friday it will start labeling posts that are newsworthy but violate the company's policies and would remove content that incites violence or suppresses voting rights, even if it originates from politicians. The announcement comes after CEO Mark Zuckerberg faced mounting pressure for refusing to take action against posts by President Trump, including one threatening violence against protesters. Facebook's market value dropped dramatically Friday after Unilever announced it was temporarily pulling ads from the platform due to concerns over hate speech. Other major brands, including Coca-Cola, Honda, Hershey and Janisport, also joined over a hundred other companies boycotting Facebook. Georgia's hate crime law will go into effect later this week, after it was signed into law by Governor Brian Kemp Friday. Georgia was one of only four states without a hate crimes law. However, the NAACP and others are calling out a police protection measure that was also approved by Georgia lawmakers last week, which some say will further endanger African Americans. In immigration news, a federal judge said Friday Trump does not have the authority to divert Pentagon funds without congressional approval to construct parts of his border wall. The Trump administration circumvented Congress after declaring a national emergency on the U.S.-Mexico border last year. However, the fate of the wall remains uncertain, since the rulings in opposition to a Supreme Court decision last year that granted Trump the right to use the defense funds. The ACLU said it would return to the Supreme Court, if necessary, to stop construction of the wall. The New York Times has published a report claiming a Russian military intelligence unit secretly offered bounties to Taliban-linked militants for killing U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The Washington Post reports the bounties are believed to have resulted in the deaths of several U.S. service members. The reports in The Times and The Post are based entirely on unnamed sources. Russia and the Taliban have denied the allegation. President Trump says he was never briefed on the claim because U.S. intelligence agencies, quote, did not find this info credible, unquote. A spokesperson for the National Security Council said, quote, the veracity of the underlying allegations continue to be evaluated, unquote. The reports come as peace talks are about to begin between the Taliban and the Afghan government. 
Pakistan Stock Exchange came under attack today when four gunmen tried to storm the building in Karachi. At least seven people died in a firefight, the four gunmen, as well as three security officers. The Balochistan Liberation Army, a separatist group, claimed responsibility for the attack. In Colombia, outrage has erupted after seven soldiers confessed to gang-raping a 13-year-old indigenous girl. The girl is from the Embera tribe. The soldiers face up to 30 years in prison. Women's rights activists and indigenous groups in Colombia say they hope this case will be a turning point in punishing rampant gender-based violence and crimes against indigenous people. In Mexico, more than two dozen gunmen, armed with grenades and sniper rifles, attacked the police chief of Mexico City Friday morning, leaving him hospitalized and three others dead, two of his bodyguards and a female bystander. The police chief blamed members of the powerful Jalisco New Generation Cartel for the brazen attack, which took place in what's considered one of the most secure areas of Mexico City. Mexican police have arrested 19 suspects after carrying out a number of raids. Meanwhile, authorities in Mexico have arrested two people in connection with the recent assassination of a federal judge and his wife inside their home in Colima State. Back in the United States, 17 workers at Rikers Island will face disciplinary action for the death of Laylene Polanco, a transgender Afro-Latinx woman who was found dead in her jail cell in June last year. Four officers were suspended without pay. And in more news from New York, thousands took to the streets Sunday for the second annual Queer Liberation March. Protesters carried signs that read, Black Trans Lives Matter, and defund the police, and held banners with the names of transgender people who've been killed. The march made its way through the streets of Lower Manhattan to the legendary Stonewall Inn, gathering near Washington Square Park, where police officers descended on the crowds, unleashing pepper spray and arresting at least four people. This weekend marked the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Stonewall riots led by black and brown trans women, which sparked the modern-day LGBTQ movement. The Queer Liberation March emerged last year as an alternative to the corporate-sponsored LGBTQ Pride Parade, which was held virtually this year due to the pandemic. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Coronavirus cases have now topped 10 million worldwide, with more than a half million deaths. Brazil, second only to the United States in the number of cases and deaths, registered its highest number of infections in a week, as protests this weekend denounced the right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro's handling of the crisis. On Friday, the United States reported the highest number of new cases in a single day since the start of the pandemic, as cases continue to surge. Confirmed infections have now topped 2. 2.6 million in the United States, with over 126,000 reported deaths. A quarter of the deaths and infections in the world, though the U.S. has only under 5 percent of the world population. This all amidst worsening outbreaks in Florida, Texas and Arizona. Secretary of Health and Human Services Alex Azar warned the U.S. needs to act immediately. The window is closing. We have to act, and people as individuals have to act responsibly. We need to social distance. We need to wear fi our face coverings if we're in settings where we can't social distance, particularly in these hot zones. Despite this one warning, this dire warning, Secretary Azar defended President Trump in the same interview for his refusal to wear a mask, since Trump is regularly tested. During an appearance with Texas Governor Greg Abbott in Dallas, Vice President Mike Pence changed course from previous remarks and said, quote, wearing a mask is a good idea. During the same visit, he attended a Dallas church Sunday, where he wore a mask as he sat in the front row as a choir of over 100 people performed unmasked. Choruses are known as super-spreading events. Over 2,000 people attended the event, many also not wearing a mask. On Friday, Pence touted the nation's, quote, truly remarkable progress, even as the U.S. reported a record 40,000 new cases in the previous 24 hours. He also commented on new data showing an increase in young people becoming infected. Inarguably, as we see where we are today as a nation, because of what the American people have done, because of the incredible work of our health care workers, because of a partnership with governors in every state. We did just that. We slowed the spread. We flattened the curve. We saved lives. And we hear this in Florida, we hear this in Texas and elsewhere, is that roughly half of the new cases are Americans under the age of 35, uh, which, um, which is 
at a certain level, very encouraging news, as the experts tell us. Because as we know so far in this pandemic, that younger Americans are less susceptible to serious outcomes of the coronavirus. And um, the fact that we are finding more younger Americans who've contracted the coronavirus uh, is a good thing. Well, for more, we're joined by Laurie Garrett, Pulitzer Prize-winning science writer, former senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, author of a number of books, including Ebola, Story of an Outbreak and the Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance, as well as Betrayal of Trust, the Collapse of Global Public Health. Laurie, welcome back to Democracy Now! There's so much to unpack here. Um, you have Vice President Pence um, speaking at the first uh, public briefing of the the coronavirus task force with the scientists Burks and Fauci on Friday, after two months um, not saying people should wear masks, talking about the remarkable progress of the United States, uh, and then on Sunday, after enormous criticism, finally wearing a mask in Dallas. Just talk about the state we are in. The, the globe has topped 10 million cases. A quarter of them are in the United States, um, as well as a half a million deaths, and again, a quarter of them are in the United States when we have just over 4 percent of the population. Amy, I was thinking about that. I think the first time I was on this show talking about COVID 19, it didn't have a name yet. We just said the coronavirus in our Wuhan virus at the time. And it was February, and I told you that best case scenario was we would get out of this in 36 months. Well, it's been, uh, what, five months since then, and uh, I do think we have at least three years ahead of us. Um, this, is, this has just been a massive case of denial, of idiotic government policy, of the lack of any strategic planning, any really specific strategic goal. And I'm not just speaking of the United States. Almost the entire world has screwed this up. Even in Europe, where they've managed to bring their epidemic down after great pain and suffering, and in places like Japan, where they never really had a serious spike because they took such excellent proactive steps, the whole world's efforts and all the sacrifices that people have made elsewhere in the world are imperiled by our out-of-control pandemic. And as you said, uh, we represent about a quarter of the entire global burden, if you add in uh, the, the next big three, Brazil, India, and Russia, uh, you make up half of the entire global total of this uh, pandemic. And what that means is that unless we control our efforts in our country and in those other three, the whole world gets imperiled by reinfection and reinfection and reinfection coming from American travelers, Brazilian travelers, Indian travelers, Russian travelers. So we have a duty not just to ourselves and to Americans that we hopefully care about, uh, senior Americans in nursing homes we hopefully care about, but we have a duty to the whole planet and in particular to countries that don't have the resources we have, that don't have the capacity to conquer their own outbreaks, whether they're desperately poor or they lack an entire infrastructure of health or both. So, uh, Amy, we're in very, very dire straits right now. So let's talk about what has to be done. Um, you have that quote of the vice president talking about young people. At the beginning, there was no sense of what was happening to young people, because everyone was told to shelter at home, and it was the sickest people and the dying that were who were going to the hospital. But now there's much more chance, um, though there was in places like Germany and China, to get information from them, um, to learn about what's happening to young people and the spike in the infections in young people. And when you address this, if you can talk about the different kinds of effects, you've got the respiratory effects that we all know about, lungs filling up that can be seen. Um, but then you also have what looks like the vascular effects, kids stroking out, you know, having strokes, getting blood clots. Talk about the two different ways of presenting and what this means. Well, it's more than two, Amy, actually. This virus affects the entire body. And the more we look at it, the longer we have uh, this epidemic go on so that we see more and more cases. Uh, 
it's looking like just about every single organ system in the entire human body is affected by this virus, directly or indirectly. I think because the initial presentations in China were all about pneumonia, we tended to think of it as a respiratory disease. But really, profoundly, it's a cardiovascular disease. The entire cardiovascular system is affected by infection with this virus. And we're beginning to understand that some people who have seemingly asymptomatic or very mild infections may in fact have long lasting problems in their bodies that result from having been exposed to the virus. So that it's, it's a whole host of factors. I mean, we know the virus can infect the brain and the long standing repercussions of a neurological infection can be quite profound, including long term depression, uh, loss of smell, loss of taste, loss of certain hearing problems, uh, visual problems, um, and, uh, you know, certain kinds of cognitive issues. We see uh, uh, the entire blood vascular system is affected. Blood vessels can be constricting. Uh, you can see people having strokes, having uh, tachycardia events, having a host of different issues related to plaque buildup or not. Um, interestingly, taking statins seems to be helpful. So that implies that some of the same mechanism that are involved with cholesterol buildup and plaque formation as a contributor to heart disease may somehow uh, have a similar role with this virus. Uh, and the renal problems, the kidney problems are really profound. Many people who have recovered and are out of hospital after weeks of struggling with this virus have permanent kidney damage. Uh, and we're beginning more and more to realize that, you know, this isn't like having the flu. You get over it. Uh, you have a couple of weeks where you're still a little shaky and then boom, you know, after that period of time, you're A-OK. -okay. This is not like that. People are having permanent damage. Even Guillain-Barre syndrome, the neurological partial paralysis syndrome that affects the limbs, has turned up with this virus. So let's talk about the means of prevention and what it means that President Trump has equated a wearing a mask with being weak, um, wearing a mask and not wearing a mask with being a Trump supporter. You now have the Republicans like Mitch McConnell wearing a mask. Uh, Liz Cheney tweeted her father, Dick Cheney, the former vice president, wearing a mask, saying real men wear masks. So the Republican Party is getting it, especially as Florida and Texas their numbers just skyrocket. Um, but President Trump insists on not wearing a mask and says testing should be slowed down because um, it just uh, — you find more cases that way. And if you didn't test, um, you wouldn't find those cases. Look, Amy, let's be clear. This whole situation in the United States is a failure to develop a federal strategy. So we have no real overarching strategic plan that web creates a webbing between the various states so that we don't have a situation where states are competing against each other or undercutting one another, as is now the case and has been from for months now. Uh, and the problem is that without a federal strategic plan, and without real genuine federal targets, uh, the president is simply using the whole COVID issue uh, to coincide with his reelection needs. So he doesn't think he gets reelected if he appears on camera all the time wearing a mask. He doesn't think that's a good look for a, a president who's trying to come across like a real winner, like somebody who built the economy and conquered the virus and made life better again for Americans. Uh, what does the mask imply? Well, it implies there's a threat out there, and that threat hasn't been conquered by the fearless leader. Um, I, I just feel that the president has, you know, it, it, maybe three, four months ago, it was possible to say, well, maybe there's more to this than the president's reelection. Maybe there's some strategic issues in the background that we don't know about that the White House is considering. But this far down the road, looking at the situation in Texas, in Arizona, in Florida, in Arkansas, in Oklahoma, in South Carolina, we can go down the list. It's 30 states on the rise, with at least 10 of them 
really spectacularly on the rise. So can you explain why masks are so important? It may be obvious, but at the beginning, perhaps they were playing it down because the country didn't have enough masks, even for the health care workers. But why the simple process of putting on a mask um, can mean that you're saving tens of thousands of lives across the country. Um, and then talk about, do you think states like Florida, um, California, uh, Texas, Arizona should be shutting down, sheltering in place. They had defied the CDC guidelines, Florida and California, not only to a plateau, to flatline, but to um, to flatten the curve, rather, but to wait a few weeks to see that the rate was going down. Early in the epidemic, when we thought this was a very similar virus to SARS, I actually said, you don't need to wear a mask outdoors. It didn't work for SARS. It won't work for this. It's really not relevant. But I've learned my lesson, and I think the whole entire medical and scientific community have learned a lesson. Uh, you know, back in February and early March, we didn't realize how deeply contagious this virus is. And it's contagious in two ways that involve your mask, wearing a mask. The first is uh, the kind of propellant that comes from coughing um, or sneezing and <laughs> and you're, you're creating a plosive sort of propelling droplets forward. Uh, in that situation, the droplets may actually be visible to the naked eye. They may, may not even be microscopic. But the good news is they will go out, but they're contained within heavy water droplets. So gravity takes over and they fall to the ground. The much worse, which is what's carried by asymptomatic carriers and people with very mild infections, involves no coughing involves just normal patterns of speech, as I am doing right now, involves normal breathing, involves the kind of slightly accelerated breathing that comes with being a jogger or uh, having some kind of exercise. And in those situations, you're propelling virus in microscopic sized water droplets that cannot be seen. And they are not as gravitationally affected. They will go outwards and linger and get caught in air streams and move around within an enclosed space for hours and hours and hours on end. And in that way, you as an individual walking without a mask on into a store, into a restaurant, into a friend's house, uh, and standing there having normal speech are basically contaminating the atmosphere of the space. And as long as our windows are closed uh, or it's, a slight, it's not a good air flow through space, um, the contamination will remain for a considerable amount of time. So you don't even know you're infected. You don't know you're a carrier. You have no particular symptoms. You're 25 years old. You feel fearless. Uh, what's What could possibly threaten you? But you just managed to threaten a whole group of people you got in contact with. I mean, Amy, you probably have been following the case of the Harper's Bar in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, they opened up when Michigan started opening up. Uh, it was legal what they were doing. Doing. The bar was a very popular hotspot in that college town, packed with 20-somethings. Everybody took their masks off, you know, or they had them dangling from one ear, you know, it was like a fashion statement. A lot of drinking. And now, uh, last count, more than 80 people have been contact traced to having COVID directly because they went to that bar. Well, the only way to deal with that situation is to shut the whole bar down disinfect the entire place, open all the windows, put fans in, blow the place clean. And this is what we're dealing with all over the entire United States now, is situations where people refuse to wear a mask. They take it as a political, you know, don't tread on me, baby. I have a right in America. You can't tell me what to do. Well, it's true. I can't tell you. I can't walk in and make you put on your seatbelt unless I'm a cop. I can't make you wear a motorcycle helmet unless I'm a cop. But both of those are th things that affect only you. You know, everybody in your car won't die because you didn't wear a seatbelt, but you will die. But this is a situation where we're asking you to be a good citizen and give a damn about the people around you. And if you can't do that, if you can't manage to care about them the way you would, say, with secondhand smoking uh, or you would with uh, various kinds of pollution that you might use uh, 
pesticide you spray on your front lawn as the wind blows it into your neighbor's windows. Uh, if this is your attitude, your neighbors, you, your neighbors can just go ahead and have that pesticide because you felt like killing ants on your front lawn. Um, then you're not a good American and you're not a good Christian and you're not a good spiritual being. You're a jerk. Um, the issue of testing. While President Trump says everyone can get a test, I have a friend right here who just got a test. Took seven days to get the results of that test. There is no way to make plans or to uh, operate in a way of opening up when it takes that long, if you're lucky enough to get one. In Texas, people waited hours and hours and hours. In Arizona, the lines were off the charts just to get one test. But in fact, public health professionals are saying you should be getting many tests as you treat, try to reopen the country. What is wrong? Why aren't they spending? They spend a trillion dollars on bailouts for the wealthiest people in the United States. What about tests and masks? Oh, dear, this is so complicated. Uh, those of you who haven't already may want to go online and watch the segment on last night's 60 Minutes about why all the antibody tests are a mess. These are the tests, sometimes called serology tests, that measure whether you ever have been infected, not whether you are right now. And then the nucleic acid tests are meant to determine whether you have virus in your body at this moment. The FDA has essentially, you know, thrown up its hands and let uh, the market get flooded with garbage. There are so many tests out there that just simply don't work or give completely inaccurate and unreliable results that states have spent millions and millions of dollars buying bogus products because, again, we have no federal strategy, no federal system of being a gatekeeper and determining which tests really work and then distributing, distributing them as needed to the states. So the states have been in this wild, wild west situation of competing against not only other states but other countries uh, with, you know, less than uh, honest shady dealers in places like southern China or in the Philippines or, you know, all over the world and being sold just utter crap. So how and can that be turned around? Well, you need a federal government that gives a darn about taking the reins in this epidemic. And I'm sorry, but this government shows absolutely no signs of doing so. Laurie Garrett, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Pulitzer Prize-winning science writer, former senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. When we come back, we'll look at the police killing of Elijah McClain, a 23-year-old African-American massage therapist who was attacked almost a year ago by Aurora, Colorado police. As he said to them, I'm an introvert. I'm different. We'll speak with his family's attorney. Stay with us. Ashanti Floyd and Lee England Jr. joining others at a Justice for Elijah McClain protest over the weekend in Aurora, Colorado. A uh, violin vigil, because Elijah played the violin. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we go to Colorado, where police pepper sprayed protesters after thousands shut down a highway in Aurora Saturday to demand justice for Elijah McClain. He's the 23 year old African American man killed by police last August. Elijah's story is facing renewed scrutiny and outrage amidst the nationwide uprising against police brutality. Last week, Colorado Governor Jared Polis ordered Colorado Attorney General to investigate the death 
on the night of August 24, 2019. Elijah was walking home from a store where he bought iced tea, when someone called 911 on him to report a, quote, suspicious person, though they said he was unarmed. McLean was wearing a ski mask, something his family says he often did because he had anemia and got cold easily. Police body camera footage, a warning this footage we're showing contains disturbing scenes, shows three Aurora police officers answering the call, attempting to handcuff Elijah McLean. He was unarmed, had committed no crime, was simply walking home. After one officer grabbed him by the arms, Elijah said, quote, I'm an introvert. Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking. Leave me alone. Despite this, the officers then used a chokehold that's since been banned to bring McLean to the ground. In body camera footage of the encounter, McLean can be heard saying the same words George Floyd and Eric Garner uttered in their final moments, I can't breathe. Again, a warning to our audience, the following video contains disturbing footage of police violence. I was just going home. Why? I'm an introvert and I'm different. You come out? Yeah. Uh, no. Was he out? Uh, yeah. I heard some no. snoring. I just yeah, don't like going home. Yeah. I'm just different. You I'm just different. Yeah. That's all. I'm sorry. I'm just different. That's all I was doing. It was actually Rosenberg. I'm just so Excuse sorry. Me, you're done, dude. I have no that's gun. Why, that's why I tried for it. I don't do lie. that stuff. I don't do... Any fighting? Other units that are not here. Why were you slow down a little bit? I don't lose the huggers. I don't even kill flies. I don't eat beef. I. I'm not a vegetarian. I don't judge people. No, I mean. Medical responders soon arrived on the scene and injected Elijah McLean with ketamine, a kind of anesthetic, for. Someone the size of 300 pounds. He is 140 pounds. He suffered a cardiac arrest on the way to the hospital, died several days later. Footage from the night of Elijah McLean's killing is incomplete because the officer's body cameras did not capture the entire encounter. The police say the cameras fell off during the arrest, but in one clip from that night, a police officer is seen telling another officer on the scene to move his body camera. Listen carefully as the audio is muffled. I can't breathe directly because. Move your camera, dude, one police officer said to another. In another clip of Elijah's arrest, one of the officers hands his body camera to another officer on the scene, saying he shut it off. Here you go. Uses this mine. It was recording. I just shut it off because it's yeah. split in half. <laughs> so. One of the officers claimed Elijah McLean reached for the officer's gun during the arrest. But in this clip from the body camera, police officer Jason Rosenblatt tells another officer on the scene he did not feel Elijah grab his gun. Brody tells me to try to grab my gun. So pull him down while, while he's, like, yeah, so he pulls his arm free and comes out. And um, I don't remember feeling it because I was focused on him. But he's like, you trying to grab a gun? So I'm like, okay, so he comes down and, yeah. The three officers involved in the killing, Nathan Woodyard, Jason Rosenblatt and Randy Redema, were never criminally charged. They were temporarily placed administratively, but have all been reinstated. Six months after his killing, an Aurora Police Department Excessive Force Review Board found the officers' actions were, quote, within policy and consistent with training. Elijah McLean was a massage therapist, a gentle soul who loved to play the violin. He would often go to animal shelters to play music for the dogs and the cats there. Well, for more on Elijah McLean's killing, we go to Denver, Colorado, where we're joined by his family's attorney, Mari Newman. Her op-ed in the Denver Post is headlined, Colorado's police reform law will help rein in worst of law enforcement behavior. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's good to have you with us, Mari. If you can take us through, once again, what you understand and how it is possible that it's only almost a year later that the attorney general is now reinvestigating this case and the officers are at work. What happened Thanks, to him that night? 
you've given a great summary of what happened. Um, you know, it's it's really atrocious that it's taken almost a year for this case to gain the kind of attention that it should have gained immediately. Back in uh, November of last year, we were standing on the steps of the municipal building in Aurora, Colorado, demanding an independent investigation. And at that time, all we heard was crickets. Um, the new mayor was elected of Aurora, Mayor Mike Kaufman. Even before he gave, came into office, he said his first order of business was going to be to address this case. He did nothing. He never reached out to the family. We heard nothing about that until very recently, after an online petition, once it reached somewhere over a million signatures, I understand that it's something over three million now, um, we uh, heard through the media that Aurora had hired a so-called independent investigator to look into the case. It turned out the uh, independent investigator wasn't independent at all, was in fact a former police officer turned lawyer whose practice is dedicated to defending officers accused of excessive force. So that's who Aurora brought in for their independent investigation, obviously uh, yet another effort to deny all accountability. So finally, now that there has been um, this massive outcry, uh, millions and millions of signatures, international media attention, the governor of Colorado has actually stepped in and called for a truly independent investigation from our state attorney general. So hopefully that will lead to some um, more robust outcome. So Elijah was walking home from the grocery store um, get with an iced tea, um, and the police stopped him. Um, and then explain exactly what they did to him. You know, at the outset, there was no legal justification for them to stop Elijah. He wasn't suspected of committing any crime. And I know you played part of the 911 clip. Um, the caller says, no, I don't believe he's committed any crime. There's no weapon involved. I'm not in danger. Nobody else is in danger. So there was no reasonable suspicion to believe he had committed any crime, and thus no reason to even stop him. And yet these three officers not just stopped him, but grabbed him, threw him up against a wall, tackled him in, onto the ground, inflicted multiple kinds of force upon him, uh, two carotid chokeholds. His entire body is covered with abrasions. Um, and as you saw, he's vomiting from the pain and as he's crying out, saying that he's he's giving his name. He's saying that he doesn't fight, that he's a vegetarian, that he doesn't kill flies, he doesn't judge people. And of course, the tragic last words that we've heard from so many uh, men who are killed by law enforcement, I can't breathe. They were mocking um, him as he threw up? It's astounding. You hear one officer saying, oh, don't get that on me. And then another one who threatens, I'm going to bring in a dog to bite you if you don't quit messing around. I mean, if that is the quality of law enforcement in Aurora, the people should be petrified. And then paramedics came in and injected him with a massive dose of ketamine. Explain what it is, why they would inject him. You know, there's no reason for them to have injected him at all. He was handcuffed on the ground. His hands were cuffed behind his back. He was down on the ground. He was being pressed down by officers, each of whom very significantly outweighed him. Um, he was being pressed down into his own vomit. He was struggling to breathe, but he was not fighting. So there was no reason to inject him with anything at all, much less a dosage of ketamine that would have been appropriate, if for anybody, for somebody well over twice his size. So what are you calling for now? I mean, the, the vigils that have been held for him, the violin vigils of thousands because he played the violin, um, what does the attorney general, what are you calling for? These three police are out on the street working? The three police just very recently, within the last couple of weeks after this case uh, gained international attention, have now been placed on desk duty, not to, not to protect the public, but protect them. So this just is one more illustration of Aurora's motivations here. The, the city has not been concerned one bit about the safety of the public. In fact, the only officer who received even the tiniest hand slap was the one who threatened to sick a dog on a dying man who was being sh pressed down into his own vomit. The rest well, were back out on the street until just a couple of weeks ago. What does so his mom want to see? What does you know, Elijah's mom? 
Elijah's family hopes to see all of the officers who were involved criminally prosecuted, certainly the three who are directly involved, but also the seven officers, including a sergeant, who stood idly by and failed to intervene as their son was being killed. A sergeant who even says he was becoming increasingly concerned about Elijah's physical well-being, but did nothing about it. And then, of course, the two medics who gave him this massive dose of ketamine, they should also be criminally charged. Mari Newman, I want to thank you for being with us, attorney for Elijah McLean's family in Aurora, Colorado. We're breaking for 30 seconds, and we go to Louisiana, where two environmental activists are charged with, quote, terrorizing. Um, and we'll find out why. Stay with us. Softly performed by violinist Ashanti Floyd and Lee England Jr. during the Justice for Elijah McLean protest over the weekend, a violin vigil, because Elijah played the violin. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we head to Louisiana, where two environmental activists face up to 15 years in prison for leaving a box of plastic pollution found on the Texas coast at the home of an oil and gas lobbyist in December. Ann Rolfus and Kate McIntosh, members of the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, turned themselves into the Baton Rouge Police Department Thursday, facing, quote, terrorizing felony charges for the action, which was part of a campaign to raise awareness about plastic pollution. They both made $5,000 bail later in the day and were released. The complaint against the activist claims they meant to cause fear when they left a box filled with plastic pellets, known as nurdles, outside the home of lobbyist Greg Bowser, along with a note that read in part, quote, these are just some of the billions of nurdles that Formosa Plastics dumped into the coastal waters of the state of Texas, unquote. The action was part of a campaign to halt plans by Formosa Plastics to build a new plant in St. James Parish in an area known as Cancer Alley. Pam Spees, a lawyer with the Center for constitutional rights, who's representing Rolfus and McIntosh, says the charges are meritless and meant to intimidate protesters. For more on this case and the criminalization of activism in Cancer Alley, we go to New Orleans, where we're joined by two guests. And Ralphus is with us, director of the group Louisiana Bucket Brigade, one of the activists facing the felony charges, and Gregory Manning, pastor of Broadmoor Community Church, part of the Coalition Against Death Alley and the Greater New Orleans Interfaith Climate Coalition. Reverend Manning was charged with inciting a riot as he led a peaceful protest along Cancer Alley in October of 2019. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! And you just turned yourself in. Explain what you're being charged with right now and what it is um, that you left. Uh, what were these plastic pellets? Well, the community of St. James, Louisiana, which is a historic black community, is under threat of destruction by Formosa Plastics. And last December, as our Department of Environmental Quality was considering the permit, uh, at this very same moment, in Texas, a judge found Formosa Plastics guilty of violating the Clean Water Act, and the company settled the largest Clean Water Act fine in U.S. history, $50 million. So what we did is we brought the evidence from that case to Louisiana. It certainly seemed relevant. Uh, we really couldn't believe that our state would even contemplate having this facility come into our, uh, into our state, given what had just happened in Texas. And so we thought it was really timely and really urgent to provide this evidence not only to our state, but also to some of the lobbyists who are gearing up to destroy, again, the black community of St. James Parish with what would be the largest plastics plant in North America. So what are these plastic pellets and where did you leave them? They're just little tiny plastic pieces that they melt into all sorts of useless things like 
throw away cutlery in plastic bags that none of us need. And so we visited the homes of some of the oil and gas and chemical lobbyists and, and brought them the evidence from Texas. Again, the state was considering at that very moment letting this same serial polluter into our state. And we felt that the lobbyists ought to reckon with the fact that they are destroying black communities, a historic black community here in Louisiana, and all for what? for plastics that nobody needs. These are felony charges of terrorizing. What do you face? 15 years in prison. Um, I was put in shackles. Uh, my colleague Gregory Manning, who was on the show today, was pinned to the ground uh, later, late last year when he protested against the oil and gas and chemical industry. And Sharon Levine, who is the president of Rise St. James, the group that's leading the charge to stop Formosa practice. Formosa Plastics, she's been visited repeatedly by sheriff's deputies. So it's a long chain of intimidation because of our very successful campaign to stop Formosa. It's clear that this is nothing more than retaliation. Pastor Gregory Manning, um, you've been arrested as you lead protests. They say you're inciting uh, riot. Can you talk about St. James Parish and why you're so deeply concerned, why it's been called Cancer Alley? Thank you, Amy. You know, we not only call it Cancer Alley, as it's been called historically, but we have given it a new name, and that's Death Alley, because not only is it uh, has the most uh, highest rates of cancer than anywhere in the nation, it has the highest rates of all sorts of other diseases, such as autoimmune disease and asthma and respiratory issues. And so, and these are people who I want to say are the African descendants of slaves. And so we're standing with them to say that these folks are being poisoned. They're literally saying that we cannot breathe. They're crying out for people to notice that these petrochemical industries have moved into this land, all, over 100 of these, and that have consistently terrorized them and poisoned them on a daily basis. I'm talking men, women, and children. And so I believe that as clergy, as a pastor, that I cannot sit idly by and watch these people be poisoned and killed uh, ruthlessly by these petrochemical industries and oil and gas industries. Pastor Manning, can you talk about um, Formosa Plastics in the context of environmental racism and the vast racial disparities that um, uh, your parishioners and people all over the country in black and brown communities are facing when it comes to COVID and how this all comes together now? I believe that people must understand that this area of St. John and St. James Parish ha are also experiencing the highest rates of death by coronavirus than anywhere else in the nation. When we look at that, we it's just astonishing that while we see that these chemical con uh, chemical industries are continuing to have production, that they're considered by our legislators to be essential operation. And Ann and I ask ourselves, why are these businesses not considered non-essential? Why is it essential to produce plastics and wetsuits and all of these in these uh, predominantly African-American communities where we have the African descendants of slaves? Why are their lives considered unnecessary? When we talk about the Black Lives Matters movement, we have to look and we have to ask ourselves, do these Black Lives Matter? Do these black lives that are located in St. James Parish, do they matter? And I have to say as a clergy, as a pastor, that they not only matter to me, they matter to God. And what we want is for people to take notice that these folks are literally being poisoned each and every day. And they're being told that, no, your lives don't matter for the sake of profit, for the sake of gain, for the sake of these petrochemical industries. And we hear them crying out. There is a cemetery of formerly enslaved people. Um, uh on the proposed building site, Pastor? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, this Formosa Plastic Company has known, they've literally been informed that there is an ancestral burial ground of our enslaved ancestors that they have discovered, and they literally absolutely don't care. They are willing to desecrate this cemetery, move these the, the resting place of these enslaved ancestors of ours to build this Formosa Plastics Company that will further ravage the land. And 
on the day that the that the warrant was issued for Kate and Ann, we just got done with a wonderful, magnificent celebration of Juneteenth remembering these enslaved ancestors. Pastor Gregory Manning will certainly continue to cover this a coalition against Death Alley and Greater New Orleans Interfaith Climate Coalition and Ann Ralphus, Louisiana Bucket Brigade. That does it for our show. Happy birthday to John Randolph. Um, please stay safe and wear a mask. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.